Good morning. My name is Bill Gazelle. I'm with the SCSA out of the Saskatoon office, and I'm here today to bring you the ninth installment of our Toolbox Tuesday. Uh, today's topic that was selected was frame scaffolding. Now, I'm going to switch to my PowerPoint here, and uh, we'll proceed by going through some information, and hopefully you can get a little, quick little bit of info on the use and some of the precautions with frame scaffolding. So again, welcome to uh, Toolbox Talk Tuesday. Every Tuesday at uh, 10 o'clock, the SCSA provides some information uh, that you can share with your workers or yourself in regards to some uh, topic of uh, concern within the industry, whether it's PPE on some of them. We've talked about scaffolding. Uh, we've talked about silica. These are also available on our website, and I'll provide a link for that at the end of today's discussion. So again, we're going to be talking about a little bit about frame scaffolding, uh, discussion a little bit about the legislation and the application of it to you and your job site. Now, the first thing that we need to do is we need to define a scaffold. And a scaffold means a temporary elevated platform and the platform supporting structures that are designed to support workers, hand tools, or workers' equipment and materials. So a lot of us use scaffolding on a day-to-day -day basis on our job sites, if not daily, uh, we find that most projects will have scaffolding in one way, shape, or form on site for any period of time moving forward. When we are talking about scaffolding, though, we have to look at the two different uses for those scaffolds that show up on site. Now, those are defined again through the Act and Regulations as a light duty and a heavy duty scaffold. The definition of a light duty scaffold means a scaffold that is intended to support workers and materials for current use only, and with no storage of other materials except for the workers' tools and that is designed to support the loads identified in Clause 172.1a. The definition of a heavy-duty scaffold means a scaffold that is intended to support workers, equipment, and stored or stacked materials, and is designed to support the minimum loads identified in 172b. Now, if you were to look in the Act and Rates and read through 172.1a and b, it becomes slightly confusing. There's some information about perpendicular lines and imaginarily drawn to the, the outer edge of a platform and uh, kilonewtons and whatnot. But to give you a, a more straightforward idea on what the differences between light duty and heavy duty scaffolds themselves are, is that scaffolds as a light duty and heavy duty can distinction is made based upon their use and no, not so much the components. Uh, the material difference being the strength of the working platforms. So when you have stored and stacked materials, we really want to start looking at what type of distance there is between the scaffold frames. And that, for the most part, determines a lot of what the working load of that scaffold can be and what type of strength those planks can support. Of course, the greater the span, the less strength of the platform. So when you are selecting scaffolding for your job site, you do want to make sure that you have selected the appropriate types of frames for the work being done and the appropriate planking uh, and span between those frames for the intended use. Once you've selected the appropriate frames, one thing that we often see when we conduct our site inspections is that scaffolding is placed on insufficient sills. So Regulation 172 says that an employer contractor shall ensure that a scaffold that is built from the ground or other surface is supported by a foundation that is of sufficient area, stability, and strength to ensure the stability of the scaffold, and that it is set on a stable sill that is at least 38 by 240 millimeters and continuous under at least two consecutive supports. And where an upright could penetrate that sill, a base plate is installed at the upright. So on the legs of your frame scaffolding, if you're building a frame scaffolding on the exterior of a building and you place that scaffolding on made up ground or otherwise, it needs to be uh, secured or it needs to be properly set on a 38 by 240 or a two by 10 piece of material that is consecutive under two supports. And what that looks like hopefully is that you have a nice complete uh, set of sills that run from one leg of the scaffold to the other. Using other components when it says the upright of course, as you apply weight to a frame or to a scaffold, the, the opportunity that that hollow tube that the frame is consisting of could easily penetrate a sill with enough force applied to it. So we wanna make sure that we have base plates installed at the, uh, at the bottoms of our scaffold. And for the best practice, you want to uh, always try to look at seeing if you can use adjustable screw jacks. 
Uh, no surface is perfectly level, whether you believe the inside of your shop floor is or otherwise, there's always going to be a slope and that slope can affect scaffolding stability as the height increases. This is one thing that we most certainly want to try to avoid, which is the use of improper material to level a scaffold and improper sills to prevent it from sinking into the ground and becoming unlevel. Uh, the idea of this not only is, uh, again, an incredibly poor example of housekeeping, but none of those stills, sills that are used or the material used to level and secure the scaffolding is appropriate for the task being done. Again, the installation of a mud sill and then at the base of the scaffold, the screw jack or leveling screw will help prevent situations like we saw in the previous slide. When it is all done, a scaffold that has a proper sills and materials underneath of it to provide stability and strength for that scaffold to ensure that it uh, remains level and doesn't sink into the, into the ground is, as you see here, nice appropriate sills placed underneath uh, consecutive supports and the use of adjustable screw jacks to ensure that you can get a proper plumb and level scaffold moving forward. Another thing that we want to talk about is uh, Regulation 248. And what that states is that an employer contractor shall maintain or shall provide and maintain a safe means of entrance and exit from a place of employment and all work sites and all work related areas in or on that place of employment. One thing with scaffolding is certain styles of scaffolding don't provide for appropriate access. So we want to start looking at what other solutions can we do to ensure that we have safe access to the scaffold for the workers. Um, a number of types of scaffolding, of course, climbing the cross braces or climbing the exterior of uh, scaffolding, especially the one seen in the picture on the right, is not permittable. The scaffolding on the right is not designed, intended, or to be used as ladders. Those are for uh, the use of work positioning platforms and not for climbing. So we want to try to find ways that we can provide, again, that safe means of entrance and exit to that workplace for the workers. So by the use of uh, commercially available ladders or stair sections as seen in the illustrations here, or by the installation of a portable ladder, ensuring of course that the slope is correct and it's secured against accidental movement. So. Uh, another thing that uh, often comes up when we're on site that we see is uh, <coughs> incorrect planking in scaffolds. So again, of course, there is a regulation that applies directly to the planking of scaffold, and that is 174.1. Uh, an employer contractor shall ensure that scaffold planks are inspected by a competent worker to ensure that the scaffold planks are free of defects before they're incorporated into the scaffold. Uh, subsection B, subject to subsections two and four, are 38 by 240 millimeter number one grade structural spruce lumber or material of greater or of equivalent or greater strength. So we want to try to make sure that again if you are selecting um, material for your platforms that you meet and comply with this regulation with the the use of uh, two by ten material uh, watching out for that uh, catch at the bottom that it is number one grade structural spruce or material of greater or equivalent strength. Uh, the finding of number one grade structural spruce from your local lumber yards will prove very difficult. So there are better options as in the manufactured or glue laminated planks that can be uh, purchased from any scaffolding supplier uh, and often from your uh, material supplier as well too. Another thing is that they're laid uh, the same thickness as adjoining planks. So when you are building a working platform, uh, you want to make sure that you are using a consistent material to prevent any trip hazards on that platform of the scaffold to which the workers will be standing on. Uh, they are also laid so tightly side by side with the adjoining planks to cover the full width of the required width of that platform itself. So we don't of course want to have one plank and then spaced six inches and then another plank placed there as well, uh, providing an opening to which the worker could either step or fall into. They are also secured to prevent accidental movement or inadvertent movement in any direction. And what that looks like is, <clears throat> we'll see in a few slides up here, how you can go about securing those planks and preventing them from moving. As well, uh, subsection three, as it spoke about in the other one, it talks about what the minimum platform widths are for your working platforms. So going back to the information for that light duty scaffold, where we spoke about uh, workers, uh, tools, and equipment, and current use materials, that that minimum width of that working platform on that scaffolding is a half meter wide. And if you are putting it up and using it for stored and stack materials and applying it to a heavy duty scaffold, that it is at least one meter wide. 
So when we look at our pre-engineered decks, uh, the aluminum ones, they are 482.5 millimeters from side to side. And when, when we look at our uh, wooden pre-laminated, glue laminated decks, they are 230 millimeters in width. As I said, secured against accidental movement, a lot of that has to do with how we prevent the planks from sliding off the platforms. Now, when we're looking at it, uh, we also wanna make sure that we have appropriate overhangs that will help prevent the planks from uh, falling from the scaffold system itself. So one way that we start off with is we wanna make sure that our scaffold planks do not extend less than 150 millimeters or more than 300 millimeters beyond the bearers. So if we were to look at our scaffold system, and the bearers, which are the large diameter tubes on both the top and the bottom of the scaffolding where planking should only be placed. Uh, if we were to take a side view of that and we were to lay a plank on top of it, we want to ensure that we have a minimum of six to 12 inches of overhang, no more or no less on the, on the plank. So we do not want to have two or three feet overhanging one side of the bearer, nor do we want to have three inches or two inches overhanging the side of the bearer on the opposite end. Uh, when laying and overlaying planks, the same thing applies. Again, you want to make sure that you maintain that 6 to 12 inches of overhang on the opposite direction. As it said, secured against uh, accidental movement, and I made reference to in a couple of the earlier slides, uh, we can look at uh, one method shown in the illustration on the bottom with the wood decking. And what that is, is again, from a side view of the bearer, when a deck is placed on top of that bearer, then we're going to install cleats, one to prevent movement in one direction, one to prevent movement in the other direction. The only direction that's not shown here in the illustration is the potential for uplift. Now, there are many options for preventing uplift. Uh, some of that can be the installation of your toe kicks to prevent the planks from being lifted. Uh, other methods are to find ways to secure from cleat to cleat underneath the bearer to prevent it from being lifted at that point in time. So again, the cleats prevent movement in that direction and a cleat off to the side of the bearer prevents movement in the other direction. Now, with scaffolding, we know that you are working at heights. Uh, that is the intention of scaffolding is to create a working platform uh, off the ground that's similar to standing on the ground in regards to safety. So when we're talking about that, Section 116 applies. Of course, fall protection is a, is a topic that's going to be covered and can be covered many times throughout toolbox talks. But we want to ensure that an employer contractor uh, ensures that a worker uses a fall protection system at a temporary or permanent work area where the worker may fall three meters or more, or there's possibility of injury if a worker falls less than three meters. So on your standard frame scaffoldings, being that they're approximately five feet in height, uh, by the time you've added some uh, base plates and stuff, standing on top of two sections of scaffolding uh, is a good guideline to identify when a uh, fall protection system needs to be used. That being said, 116 also makes reference to if there's possibility of injury if the worker falls less than three meters. So we want to make sure that in all situations we're preventing falls on the job site, uh, however possible that we can, uh, using some of the systems available to us through scaffolding. We can see here, uh, a, you know, of course, one illustration on the left, uh, which we would hope is something that uh, a practice that nobody would be performing. But on the right here, we see that there are three sets of scaffolding. Uh, the worker at the top who is uh, gathering up a ladder, I'm hoping to not stand on while he is working on the platforms. But at that point in time, he is over 15 feet off the ground. Uh, so he would require a fall protection system to be in place for the working on the top of that scaffold section. We can see here a more common site of some of the commercial operations. Now, one thing that I circled in red for uh, the viewers here today is that the cross braces used in scaffolding do not comply to an appropriate construction of a guardrail. Um, it's kind of a common misconception within industry is that, well, I have my guardrails up, they prevent me from falling off the scaffolding. Well, they, however, are not uh, set up to the minimum guidelines laid out in the regulations for the design and construction of guardrails to prevent workers from falling off of structures. So the use of those must be augmented again with the proper horizontal uh, rails set at the appropriate heights, both the top and the mid rail. And then again, with materials that can be knocked off of that surface to the workers below, the installation of appropriate toe kicks to prevent that material from falling. Here we can see a couple of commercially designed and available systems. Uh, the one on the left and the top, again, is some posts that attach to the top of your frame scaffolding systems. 
you can see that they've got integrated tow kicks, a top rail and a mid rail system placed on them. The other sections show some more commercially available setups, again, using the uh, system style scaffolding and the standard size ledgers and bearers that could be used to, uh, again, build those guardrail systems and the use of appropriate tow kicks. One thing that uh, I wanted to finish up with today, of course, is you always want to remember to inspect your scaffolding prior to use and daily when in use. Not only does this come out of the Act and regulations as a, uh, as a requirement for workers uh, to be inspecting their scaffolding prior to use, but it's a great practice to get into. Um, even if you've left that scaffolding for a period of time in the same day, when you go back to use it again, you should be performing a visual inspection uh, or a thorough inspection, depending on the severity of use and the other people that are in that area, making sure that something hasn't happened to it in your absence and that when you come back to work, you may find that a defect was uh, caused by other workers or other equipment in that area. Uh, again, make sure you are thoroughly inspecting your scaffolding prior to each use. As I said, um, there is a, uh, at uh, the resource tab for toolbox talks at scsaonline.ca. And uh, there's a, <coughs> excuse me, a great list of toolbox talks there that you can see. Also these uh, toolbox talks and these online versions are being saved to our uh, YouTube and you're able to go on to our uh, YouTube group page and be able to see the previous eight and now this the ninth will be alive and available there. And once again, I thank you for your time uh, joining us for our Toolbox Tuesday and uh, hope to see you here for next week's 10th uh, installation of Toolbox Tuesday.